start recording. Hi, my name is Adrian Hill and I'm going to talk to you today about what Tourette syndrome looks like and look at some strategies that can be used in the classroom. Just for my background, I'm a mother of these three boys that you see pictures of. On the left is Graham and on the right is Troy and both of them have been diagnosed with Tourette syndrome plus, which means they have more than just Tourette or tics. And the middle boy is Cameron and he has many of the symptoms, but they're much milder. So we never bothered getting an official diagnosis. So I have, I was an in-service provider for Tourette Canada from 2005 to 2018 and an in-service trainer for Tourette Canada from 2016 to 2018. And presently I am an in-service provider and consultant for the Tourette Syndrome OCD Alberta Network. So just a, a disclaimer, the note, uh, the, sorry, the photos used in this presentation do not show people with Tourette syndrome and are used for illustration purposes only, except for these three that you see in front of you. So I just want to talk very briefly about labels. Even recently, I've witnessed people wanting not to to, to be labeled, uh, especially, especially parents. They have a fear that the label is going to hurt their children moving forward. Uh, they fear that a diagnosis will be more problematic than helpful. However, people tend to give their own labels. This is my experience for sure with my kids. Even myself fell into that. I, I thought that my son was a behavior problem. Uh, others thought he was a behavior problem. He was weird, lazy. Uh, he refuses to do their work at home and at school. And having a label of Tourette syndrome suddenly gave me as a parent a direction and a means to communicate to others and particularly with teachers. It opened up the possibility of strategies instead of punishment. Uh, so labels got my kids accommodations all the way through post-secondary. So not just in elementary school and high school, but also in post-secondary. I think that's really important to to know that these things don't go away once uh, high school ends. So, and I believe that we need to use labels to reduce stigma. I don't think that they promote stigma. And that's just my personal experience. So first of all, let's talk about this fellow here. His name is Gilles de la Tourette, and he worked, uh, was born 1857 and died in 1907. Uh, or 1904, sorry, and he, he was the first one to really look into Tourette syndrome and study it. And it was, it's been around forever, we feel, like it's been around for a very long time. And it is neurodevelopmental. It is a genetic disorder, so people are born with it. And it is characterized by something that's called tics. What are tics? Well, tics are voluntary capitulations to an irresistible urge. It is not easy to resist this urge, especially for young children. So elementary school teachers, please be aware that it's very difficult for younger children to control these symptoms. There is often no reason to resist and the tic becomes very, is what we would call semi-automatic. It's like an itch. The itchy feeling is not voluntary, but the decision to scratch it is. So that's what we mean by it's semi-voluntary and not, but it's not purposeful. It's like a reaction to a stimulus. Uh, so it's also interesting to note they constantly change. They never stay the same and that's what makes this disorder so difficult is that one week they're going to have this really annoying tick and then in the next week it'll be gone and then three weeks from now they have another tick that's even worse than the first tick so they're always changing it's very difficult for the people around them to deal with it's also very difficult for the individual to have this constant change that that occurs so they're very they can be very repetitive they happen over and over again and they manifest differently from one person to the next. So if you've taught one student who has Tourette syndrome, the strategies that work for that student could very well likely not work for the next student. So that because of the huge differences between students and individuals, uh, it can be very difficult to figure out the best way to help them. So they wax and wane, they come and go in number, frequency, severity, and complexity. So they keep on not only changing, but they get worse, they get better. So it gets very, very confusing for the individuals around them as well as the individuals. And they present as two different things. They have to be both actions and uh, sounds. So to be to, 
to be diagnosed with Tourette syndrome. So both of these things must be present and we'll discuss each of them in more detail uh, right now. So a simple motor tick essentially involves just one muscle group and they usually last, they're very quick and they are one second in duration. So something very, very, very quick, like this girl squinting her eyes. And there can be really rapid, darting, meaningless, and some examples, as I said, eye blinking, you can have nose wrink uh, wrinkling, shrugging, facial grimacing, mouth jerks, arm or leg jerks, jaw snapping, abdominal tensing, which you can't see. So not all ticks are visible. So just be aware of that. The person may not exhibit any ticks, but they actually are ticking. We just don't know. They could be just uh, clenching toes, etc. So those are simple motor ticks. Then we get into the complex motor ticks. And these are of longer duration, and they usually involve multiple muscle groups. They're slower, usually, and more purposeful in appearance, which can lead to people accusing them of being purposefully uh, distracting. So if we look at complex motor tics, here's some more examples, like bending and twisting head or torso, facial movements or expressions, so sustained postures of the body, slow twisting, thrusting arms, gyrating and bending, so tapping, banging, and evening up, which can also be uh, like an obsessive compulsive thing. So evening up can, can be obsessive compulsive with the difference that for Tourette syndrome, evening up is a just right phenomenon, whereas for OCD, it is connected to an obsessive thought. For example, if I don't touch both shoulders, I won't feel right, versus if I don't touch both shoulders, my mother will die. So these are examples of more complex. Now, if we go into some other motor tics that are uh, um, can look very uh, purposeful, uh, we have palapraxia, which is repetitive complex movements over and over and over again. So they hop and they hop and they hop and they hop and they hop. They spin, they hop, they spin, they hop. Echopraxia is copying the actions of others. And this is the one that can get them into trouble because it can look like they're mocking somebody when it's actually a tick. And then copopraxia is motor obscenity, such as giving the finger or grabbing genitals, which can obviously be culturally or socially inappropriate. Simple vocal tics, uh, this is the other component of Tourette syndrome that must be there. We must have both a, a motor and a vocal tic. And these usually appear one to two years after the motor tics uh, are noticed and are usually simple. They are usually, sorry, they are noticed and are usually simple. The range of vocal tics is, is huge. There's a lot of different ones. Any noise or sound that can, has the potential to be made can become a tick and they can be quiet to very loud. Some examples would be coughing, throat clearing, grunting, squealing. They're fast meaningless sounds like hiss, hissing and barking like a dog. Uh, they can also be sniffing and spitting, sucking, screeching, you name it. Uh, High-pitched squeaks, that's one of the ones that my son had, Graham. He had a very high pitch, pitch squeak that almost sounded like a mouse, but really, really, really loud. So for complex vocal tics, these are words or phrases. They're out of context speech. And for example, they are, I love chocolate milk. My youngest son had that tick when he was about in grade uh, two or three. And he would run up to people and instead of saying hello right away, would say, I love chocolate milk. Another one is shut up. And um, as I'm talking, shut up. You can see it's out of context. Shut up. That would be a tick. So it, it can sort of make sense, especially if the person's angry. All of a sudden, shut up is contextual, but it could also be a tick. Um, oh, sorry. Let's go back. And what's for dinner tonight? That is another one that my oldest son did. And you can see how it's out of context because he would ask it first thing in the morning. He would ask it when he got home from school. He would ask it during dinner and then he would ask it again after dinner. And yes, I have heard of somebody who had the your fat tick. You can see how socially inappropriate that could appear and how horrifying it would be for the person. So vocal tics, uh, they change in volume, they uh, pitch and the rate of speech can be affected, can be slowed down, it can be that very, very fast. I have a friend, Steve, who sometimes his rate of speech would get slowed right down to like he was in slow motion. 
And stuttering can be a symptom of Tourette syndrome, but stuttering does not mean you have Tourette. So just remember that uh, you can stutter, it can be part of the disorder, but it, if you are a stutterer, it doesn't necessarily mean you have Tourette syndrome. Hopefully, hopefully that's clear. So my next thing we have are vocal tics uh, that are um, a little more complex. We have palalalia, which is repeating your own words, repeating your own words. My son had this and he would often repeat his sentence under his breath uh, after he had said it. So he, he definitely had this. The next one, echolalia, that one is echoing others. So kind of like the one with the movement, this is can be um, thought of as mocking. Uh, I had a teacher at a workshop once who said he knew this kid had Tourette syndrome, and but he thought he was seeking attention because he would always say repeat things. So they were talking about the War of 1812, and the kid would go, "I was in the War of 1812." So he would always preface it was "I was in" or "I was doing." He and so they thought it was an attention-seeking thing, but really it was echolalia. It was his tick that was happening. Coprolalia. This is the one that everybody seems to know about. This is a socially inappropriate language, such as swearing. And luckily, it's only less than 10% of people with Tourette syndrome have coprolalia. And don't forget that these things change all the time. They, they come and go. And so if they have coprolalia right now, they may not have it. Unfortunately, the ticks they want to get rid of usually are the ones that last the longest. Uh, so I have an example of a, a mother who contacted us for a workshop and she her her daughter had a spitting tick and it was replaced with the swearing tick and she was like oh I'm so glad it's just the swearing tick because she really found this the spitting tick to be a lot more impactful to people around her and as well as to the daughter herself so I feel that our world, when you live with Tourette syndrome, all of a sudden our priorities change, swearing no longer becomes the big deal. So there are consequences to having these tics and they can be quite harmful and painful. Uh, for example, we have eyes rolling and that kind of thing causes headaches when they ro roll over and over and this happened to my youngest son. We have biting. My youngest son also would bite his uh, fingertips to the point where he would bite you know, his fingernails all the way down to the fingertips and then he would bite the ends of his fingers off. Uh, they don't, so things like lips, they can bite their lips, the inside of their cheeks, arms, fingers, objects. And they can do jaw snapping. You can imagine like this fellow here opening his mouth, rapid head twisting and jerking. You can get a very painful neck. And there's a, a, a boy in Calgary, I believe it was, who had such a severe jaw snapping uh, uh, tick that his jaw was dislocated. So some more examples are slapping, punching yourself with force, hitting yourself with utensils. My friend Steve would uh, ha has a tick that involves hitting himself. And if he had a fork or something in his hand and he hit it and hit himself, it usually was his head that he was trying to hit. Uh, he would have to have somebody either grab it out of his hand or he would try and put something soft in between to stop himself from getting hurt. Uh, touching and handling dangerous objects such as razor blades, knives, lit cigarettes and matches. I've seen people with Tourette syndrome who have scars on their arms if they're smokers because of a tick that makes them touch the cigarette to their arm. So some things that can make symptoms worse are anxiety, stress, excitement, and that's good stress and bad stress. That's why I put the excitement in there. So if we have a test tomorrow, the student will, ticks will be worse uh, up to and maybe even after the test. If it's going to be summer holidays or Christmas break or any of these exciting moments or going off on holiday, the symptoms will tend to get worse. Fatigue and sleep challenges are big ones as well. And of course, if they're having a bad day and they're ticking a lot, you can imagine how this tends to lead to sleep problems, which tends to lead to more ticks. So it's a vicious cycle. And then the last one is illness. Quite often, you can most people, when they get a cold, they clear their throat <clears> throat> or they get, you know, phlegm or they cough. 
or sniff. And when the cold goes away, most people, those symptoms disappear. But someone with Tourette syndrome, it could actually turn into a tick. So they're clearing their throat, clearing their throat, the cold goes away and it is now a tick. So it lasts three months, four months, maybe a year, maybe a couple more weeks. It, we never really know how long it will last. The worst one that my son Graham had was a vomiting tick and he was he got very ill he coughed so hard that he vomited and then he started coughing and vomiting every day after that and it took us about four months to figure out it was a tick because we wanted to eliminate all possible medical issues first and then we realized it was a tick and he went for a, a treatment with a psychologist to help get rid of that particular tick and we'll talk a little more about that later so another thing, this is a big one that can make symptoms worse, is seeing or hearing somebody else ticking or talking about ticks. So the fact that I'm talking about this right now, if there's somebody here who had Tourette syndrome, their ticks would be quite severe right now, most likely. We go to a Tourette conference where there's lots of people with Tourette syndrome, and they, if you talk to people attending, they will say they get, they're absolutely exhausted by the end because everybody is ticking around them and they need feel the need to do their own ticks as well as they pick up other people's ticks uh, occasionally as well so this can really make symptoms worse so what what can help with tip with ticks obviously sleep and exercise activities that require attention so if they're doing something they really really love the ticks can go away, such as playing a musical instrument. If you noticed my son in the very opening pictures, he was playing a guitar. He plays classical guitar. No ticks at all while he's playing. Video games is another good example. So they can get relief, especially when they're hyper-focused on something that they really enjoy. And periodic suppression is possible, but there's a huge cost to it. It takes intense effort and it can actually make the other ticks worse. For example, my son wanted to go to see a movie and he had that high-pitched squeaking mouse tick that I was talking about earlier and we wanted to, uh, to go to this movie. He was so badly wanted to go but he knew that he couldn't disrupt the rest of the people in the movie theater. So he suppressed his tick during the movie but I turned to look at him a few times and his eye ticks and his facial ticks and his arm ticks, everything was going was much worse because he had to suppress. And uh, just imagine trying to open your eyes. You can open your eyes like this guy and hold your breath. You can do that for a time. But if I said to you, now you're not allowed to blink while writing your test. That would be the equivalent of saying to somebody with Tourette syndrome, don't do your tick while writing this test. It's very, very difficult. You can do it, but it's difficult. And people with Tourette syndrome often suppress their symptoms, especially once they reach junior high school in that age, sort of the 12 to 15 years, because of fear of embarrassment or humiliation, fear of teasing or bullying, and also because of pain related to repetitive movement. So it, it, you know, it can be really, really difficult. And if you imagine yourself holding your eyes open right while writing a test, what are you concentrating on? Well, holding your eyes open. So it's really hard to concentrate properly whenever suppression is happening. And here's some myths I think that we need to just discuss very quickly. We've already discussed the swearing. Only 7 to 10 percent of people with Tourette syndrome have coprolalia. And so to identify Tourette syndrome as a swearing tick, I think, is, is not fair. Uh, they are not cogn cognitively impaired. Tourette syndrome does not affect IQ. People with Tourette syndrome do have the same or often higher IQ than the normal population, though uh, some have learning disabilities or attention deficit, uh, deficits as well. So it can appear like they're not as bright because they have so many difficulties. And that they can control their symptoms if they really want to. As I discussed, you can control them to some extent, but there is a tremendous cost. And remember, Tourette syndrome is not a learned behavior. It's not a result of bad parenting. I think I was a victim to this one. I was viewed as a bad parent by people who really didn't understand. And that's very hurtful and it's, it's not helpful either. So please be aware of that. It's not curable. It's not an intentional choice. And also it's not the only tick disorder. Approximately 20% of students will have ticks at some time during their childhood and their adolescence. Uh, so it's part of their brain development 
they get a tick, it lasts for six months, it goes away and never comes back. Uh, or it, you may end up with a motor tick and that's it. So, you know, maybe um, uh, some kind of eye blinking tick that just stays and you have it for the rest of your life. That is not Tourette's syndrome. It has to also have the vocal component. So the occurrence, I always like this. This is Oliver Sacks. He's a, a neurologist who really started looking into Tourette's syndrome in the 1970s. And this is from a book of his, and it said, it, Tourette's syndrome had an incidence I had read of one in a million, yet I had apparently seen three examples in an hour. This is a, a question that comes up quite regularly for me. Is there more of it? Is it because of diet? Is it, you know, what's going on? Why, why are we seeing more of it? And it, to his comment, Comment, it illustrates that it's not necessarily more people it's just we know more about it it's recognized and it's so I don't think there's been a tremendous um, increase in the number of people it's just that we now can diagnose it and are more familiar with what it looks like so the occurrence is approximately 1% of school-aged children that's one in a hundred so most schools will have more than one student that probably has Tres syndrome Three times more likely in boys than girls, and boys and girls both have the same symptoms. So there's no difference between the ages, or sorry, the, the sexes. In a meta-analysis that was completed recently, it shows that 1% for children and adolescents in populations in Europe, Asia, North, and South America. So that's where that number comes from. And uh, the other thing that's interesting, it affects all ethnic groups, though it is somewhat less frequent in individuals with African descent and it usually peaks at around age 10 to 12 and it can continue into adulthood but there is a high rate of improvement the, the numbers given usually around one-third will have less ticks like it usually gets worse at, at around puberty increases increases and then it goes back to the pre-puberty level some people a third of them will just stay the same and a third of the people their tick severity increases and my friend Steve is an example of someone who they got worse into adulthood uh, but it is less common than either they stay the same or they become less severe there's here is our uh, who I like to call our fearless leader this is Dr. Tamara Pringsheim she's running the uh, she sort of spearheaded the OCD, Tourette OCD Alberta network. And the diagnosis, this comes from the DSM-5, is the presence of more than one motor tick and at least one vocal tick. And they have, they, the ticks may wax and wane in frequency, but they must be there for more than a year. The onset of age before age 18, otherwise it's diagnosed as something different. And they are not due to a medical condition uh, or from some substance such as uh, Parkinson's, Huntington's, brain trauma, medications, or uh, other substances. So, <clears throat> so that's from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders in the 5th edition. Some treatment options. There's the pharmacological interventions. Uh, however, there's all the side effects, so very, it can be very tricky to get. There's no direct drug that's been developed for Tourette syndrome on its own. There's cognitive behavioral interventions such as CBIT. This is one of the things my son did to stop his vomiting tick. Now we don't want to stop all the, their ticks because you can't. You get rid of one, another one replaces it. They're always going to be ticks. ERP, which is exposure and response um, therapy, which is specifically used for anxiety and OCD and cognitive behavioral therapy for OCD and depression. All of these are, are, are treatment options actually that my kids went through and were very, very helpful. And the biggest problem is that most youth who are just diagnosed with Tourette syndrome don't just have tics, they have other associated disorders. And what else do they have? Well, they have ADHD, obsessive compulsive behavior, sensory phenomena, anxiety disorders, dysgraphia can be a huge issue. And of course, social communication and social function deficits. And many of the social function deficits occur because there's so much going on in their brain, they miss social cues. If they see them, they understand them, uh, but often they just can't see them because they're ticking and they maybe have ADHD on top of it and they're, they've got obsessive compulsive things happening. So it can be very uh, difficult for them to see social cues. So this is... Uh, um, an interesting chart, I think, 
and I just wanted to, to, to notice here attention difficulties in age and years. You can see it's the first one to appear. It starts here just around age four in 40 to 60 percent of patients. It's, it usually starts quite a bit earlier and then all of a sudden we see the eyes, uh, ticks, motor ticks with eyes, face and head are most common and it starts usually a little bit later. For my oldest son, he started ticking quite severely at age four, so he, he was ahead of the, this, this curve for sure. And neck and shoulder are kind of the next kind and then arms, trunk, legs. And then there's also sensory phenomena and I can say all three of my kids have these sensory issues. And if you look at the vocal ticks, they tend to come a little bit later. You can see that right here, sounds and noises, words. And here's the obsessive compulsive behaviors. They come, you know, it looks to, you know, about age nine or 10 and obsessive compulsive disorder, the full disorder, 40 to 60% of people with OCD have that. And it comes a little bit later again. So this just gives you an idea of sort of what it looks like for the, for most people. I know with my kids, my oldest son, he was much younger and my last son, he was around age seven when his tick started to come forward. Now I'm going to miss this here, this video, I thought I'd hidden it. So uh, we will, if you come to a workshop, you can watch that video. So strategies. So we recognize that many of the following strategies are already implemented in classrooms. So and I really hope to reinforce the things that you may be doing that will help with Tourette syndrome and hopefully maybe provide some new variations to, to some strategies you may already, already be trying. So one of the big questions that comes along a lot is how do you know which behaviors are Tourette syndrome and which they aren't? And it can be really hard to determine, as I mentioned with the shut up tick that you know in a, when if it's just said shut up in the middle of a sentence like this you can tell that it's not a behavioral issue but if this person is angry they're probably going to start yelling shut up so it's partly behavior and it's partly the tick however basic rules such as not harming themselves and others or property do apply to everyone that's really important so rules still need to be uh, followed within reason impact of learning so things like eye, head, neck ticks make, can make difficulty, you know, reading difficulty. Parents and teachers may see eye ticks as relatively mild, but they can cause students to avoid or postpone reading activities due to previous uh, unsuccessful attempts. So it's really important to recognize that these ones may look like they're not that big of a deal, but they can be a huge deal. So vocal ticks can make class discussions and exam quiet times very difficult. There can be an urge to t uh, an urge quite often. I talked a little bit about this. They often have a premonitory urge, and it could cause the student to worry about suppression um, of a particular, particularly the verbal tics, and it can cause them to lose focus. And uh, arm, hand, arm, and body tics can make handwriting difficult. I think that one is is fairly uh, obvious, and it's often impa impairs neat neatness, and it could be a problem. Compounded if they have obsessive compulsive tendencies, writing tends to be small and done over and over again with OC, or if they have ADHD on top of the Tourette syndrome, which tends where their writing tends to be large and sloppy, it can make writing very distressing. So it can make makes taking notes very difficult. And uh, the, there's this premonitory urge or it can cause great distraction. And back to the handwriting difficulty, that's where you know, one of the obvious things that I think teachers are pretty good at these days is to supply the notes to the students so that they don't have to write. Uh, my kids found that writing their notes while listening was very, they couldn't actually learn anything. So they learned very early on to just get the notes from the teacher and they would just listen and it, it worked really, really well. So some areas of impact. Students who are academically advanced use, find executive function deficits to be particularly distressing when they can't produce the quality of work that they are actually capable of. And so it's, you know, it's important to know that planning organizations, strategizing, paying attention to and recalling details and time management are all executive function deficits that these kids usually have difficulty with. 
what to watch out for, difficulty in attending and staying in school, behavioral issues at school, and um, behavioral issues around homework particularly, because there can be significant resistance to completing assignments, because they just, by the time they get home, they're exhausted, so they really can't do it. They can have any, watch for an increase of symptoms because there's some kind of stress going on and a loss of interest in preferred activities. That's when we really worry. If they're not even interested in doing what they like to do, we need to help these kids. And recognize decline, you know, academic, declining academic performance, like I just said. And what can happen is that it will in, result in increased anxiety and frustration, obviously, and decreased self-worth and eventual refusal to engage. And this is the big one here, uh, and I certainly was guilty of this one, which is it is perceived as lazy and unmotivated. I definitely fell into this with my oldest son. I uh, was much more aware with my other children once I'd gone through this. And recognize too that students at a younger age can do really well in school because of intelligence. But as they get older, when the material becomes more difficult, a decline in performance can be seen. And that's what you need to look out for. So students who have done well and then suddenly not. And my oldest son fell into that. He excelled in kindergarten grade one and then crashed in grade two. Uh, and that's quite young. Usually it's around uh, my older son. It was junior high when he crashed. Um, so, you know, Students with above average intelligence can show an abrupt decline in academic performance that can result in a dislike of school, and we don't want that to happen. So recognize that every student with Tourette syndrome is different. I think I talked about that already. Tick suppression should never be punished, or sorry, tick expression should never be punished. Uh, and that's really important that they realize it's school is a safe place for them to tick. And that's why it's important to educate everybody around, because if you educate everybody, then something like a tick, a cough, you know, like a sneeze or a cough, which nobody thinks twice about a tick, maybe if it was shut up, becomes like a tick or a cough. So we should never punish that. And if you don't, and it becomes a comfortable place, usually the tick, the anxiety goes down. So therefore the ticks decrease. And be careful that accommodations should not be viewed as punishment. That's a tough one, uh, especially if you, you have to take them out of a room for something. You, know, you try and make it fun. Try and make it a positive experience. Uh, and recognize accommodations are not a permanent fix, but are support while the student, learn, the student learns to manage their symptoms using behavioral strategies. So it, I think that's true for most disorder. We, we work with things while things are not good, but recognizing that in the long run, hopefully accommodations will be decreased. Potential problems. Our parents may expect that teachers know all the strategies because of course we've been trained to do that. And as teachers, we know that something like Tourette syndrome, the specifics of how to teach kids with Tourette syndrome is really not something we learn. And if you learned it in school, you're, you're lucky because I don't know many who have. Uh, the other thing is parents and students may keep the diagnosis secret. So that's a problem for teachers because then we're not working with knowledge and we can't move forward and we will see it as a behavior problem. So parents and students, when they keep it secret because of fear of labels, like I discussed, and fear of stigmatizing. If the diagnosis is shared, the teachers may question the diagnosis, and I've seen this a few times, because there's no symptoms at school. And that's due to suppression. And then they get home and then it's terrible and their symptoms are, are awful and they, um, their ticks come out and they can't get things done and they're exhausted from keeping their ticks in all day and so nothing gets accomplished. So just be careful if things look good at school uh, and if they're completing their work, that's really good. But if they're not completing their work uh, but there's no symptoms, it's probably due to suppression. Some strategies. The big one I've already talked a little bit about is just ignore the ticks. It becomes a cough in the background. We don't worry about it and everybody knows what it is and they just, it becomes a cough in the, in the classroom. Um, let students know that they don't have to hide the symptoms. As I said, then the symptoms can go down and when they're more comfortable. And allow to leave the class to relieve the ticks. So have an exit strategy that doesn't uh, draw attention to them, 
So it could be just as simple as they put something on their desk or the teacher puts something on the desk and allows them to leave to a predetermined location. It could be the office, it could be a library, it could be the bathroom, whatever you decide on, just so you know where they are if you need to find them. And extra time, this is a big one. It's allowing extra time lets the student know they can do it. So next time they won't be as stressed, symptoms will be down, and they may not need the extra time in the long run. But it's really important. Uh, my son, sometimes his tics would be so bad at the start of a test that he wouldn't even get to the main test until the extra time started. So this can be really, really important. And uh, uh, in this day and age, this is really, I think, doable, electronic access to a class. So if their tics are really, really bad, they could be in another room in the school, they could be at home, and they could, if you have a camera set up in the classroom, they could interact, they can uh, even have um, his voice, like through Zoom or something, but and then he can mute himself if his tics get bad. There's lots of ways of being able to do school without actually being in class if they have really bad symptoms on a particular day. So I think this is a big one, reducing homework. Reducing homework is really important because I've talked about how ticks usually are worse at the end of the day. And that's when they go home and that's when they're supposed to do homework. So please take this request seriously. And if they are bright, they're not gonna need to do as much homework as maybe some other students. So I think it's really important to pick and choose carefully. And extension on due dates can be important uh, because of ticks uh, with an OCD and ADHD. Students often miss, uh, miss things. So it's really important that you are open to the possibility of extensions. And it's important also to ask the student to repeat back because of the OCD, ADHD and ticks, they often miss their instructions. And so it's important that they, they are aware and, and that you are aware that they understand what you've said. Uh, my son, I, my, the teachers were great. They would give him a handout, they would write it up on the board, they would do reminders. They still wouldn't get it. And I would quite often go in and talk to the teachers and get the update on the, the dates that were, things were due. And at the other extreme, they would miss here, they would hear, you know, only hear part of a sentence, like this assignment is due next week. And he would hear this assignment is due and assume it was due that day and he would freak out. So it's really important to ask them to repeat back because they quite often get it wrong. And it's really good if you break the, um, the task into smaller parts, often using bullets and not paragraphs. And if you have the student cover the instructions, so only one or two things are available at a time, it's not as overwhelming for them. And uh, I think more and more teachers are using bullets. I know that social studies and English, it seems to be really good. Math, not as good, which is quite ironic. I'm a math teacher. And uh, it, it's, I think it's, it's funny that we've gone to more paragraphs, especially for Math 30-1. And I think we should be following the English and social studies people and doing more bullets for instructions. And separate room for exams and written activities. My oldest son had a separate room for his exams all the way through university. He actually has a master's degree in civil engineering and he had a separate room all the way through school. And it was perfect for him. And, and it's important to make it not a punishment, to make it, you know, it's, it's, it's a great thing for these kids to have access to stuff like this. And it also helps with the students who are left behind because they're not having to deal with some of the noises and, and movements that may be distracting for them writing an exam. Some strategies, redirect when stuck. Uh, it's, it, it, they get stuck quite a bit, so maybe do a different activity, maybe jump to a different part of the assignment that they might do better at, maybe go for a walk. Uh, there's lots of things what, uh, to, to do regarding redirecting. So the other thing that's really important is using non-punishment based rewards. Uh, what I mean by that is, you know, you ha I, I had an example of um, somebody whose kid had, the teacher had put up a chart in the classroom and it had stars and, and it was for behaviors and the, it would be things like finish the assignment on time, 
uh, cleaned up their desk, you know, those things, and everybody would get stars accordingly. And this student had great difficulty with all of these. So he was the only one with very few stars. So they became a punishment because he saw how poorly he was doing compared to the rest of the class. And with these rewards, you have to guarantee success or else they're not going to be effective. So if you see Johnny is you know, not getting any stars, we have to reevaluate and do something very different. So when I say guarantee success, something like, how long do you think it will take you to do this assignment? And they say 15 minutes, and then they finish it in that time. And, but you look at it and go, mm, I think this is going to take 30 minutes. That You negotiate, you make sure that they can succeed. Pro, uh, also providing written due dates um, and assignments online. I think this is happening a lot now because it was a lifesaver for when my youngest got to high school, everything was online and he could look it up and he could check and double check. So even, I don't know what it is about when it was written on the board versus online, it seems to be more effective. So the other thing that's really important because I was talking about executive function, you need to anticipate lost and forgotten supplies. Uh, so have students put, use backpacks like for high school. It's really good if they can just keep everything, their whole locker in their backpack. That's what my oldest son did. It worked really, really well. If backpacks are not allowed, as in some schools I have gone into, they don't allow backpacks, then make sure that there's textbooks and supplies in every teacher's room. And if that means that the student purchases extra supplies like pens and pencils that be, can be accessed when needles needed, then that's what we do. Just make sure that there's always going to be something there. My oldest actually disappeared from school and I got a phone call and it turned out the reason he disappeared is he had a test that day and he'd forgotten his pencil case at home and he had a meltdown and he disappeared. And so it would have, if, if this strategy of having supplies available to him had been set up beforehand, we would have avoided that situation. After that, after this happened, that's what we did and it was all good. We, everything was really, was fine. Uh, so, so it's a learning by experience sometimes with these kids. So we need to also uh, support adaptations of unacceptable tics. This can be uh, really difficult to do and we have to be creative because it can change from week to week and it can change from student to student. And I think involving classmates when appropriate, if the kid's okay with that, that's really the best way to do it. But, uh, an example I like to give is uh, a student who had a spitting tick. And the worst part of the spitting tick was that they had to spit on a person. So it wasn't that they had to spit on the floor, which was bad enough. It was they had to actually spit on a person. So the class got together and they came up with a solution and they, they, came, they decided to get a cardboard cutout of a uh, famous person that they didn't like. And I'm, I like to just throw out, you know, Justin Bieber because it's Canadian and it comes to my mind. And so they put this cut out of Justin Bieber out. And so every time he needed to spit on somebody, he would spit on Justin Bieber's cutout instead. So that's what I'm talking about with, you know, un supporting unacceptable tics and involving the class if possible. So spitting in a cup instead of the floor. Uh, if, if they have a, a tick which involves, you know, the hand flecking out and maybe they even have to touch somebody when they're flicking their hand, then get a pillow or a box or something instead of hitting the per uh, the person. I once worked with somebody who every time they saw a disabled person, they would say terrible things to this disabled person. It was a tick. It was like, you know, yeah, I, I don't remember the exact words, but they were insulting. And so you can type the insult on their phone instead of saying it to a person if they have phones. That's a good strategy. Use words that are similar to swear words. Uh, there's a teacher in the... Um, in the U.S., he was a kindergarten teacher. He had a swearing tick, and he replaced the word with duck, and he became the quacking teacher. So, so some things like that you can try to uh, to use. However, remember that that one is replacing similar words is better for older students rather than younger. It would be more difficult for younger students. It allow early access from, from class if hallways are crowded because that can cause some problems, especially if there's evening upticks. If they get bumped on one shoulder, they will have to bump somebody else. That could be bad. So let them go to class early or later, either one, so when the hallways are not as, as crowded. If they have uh, uh, 
motor tick like a punching tick or touching other people get them to carry things in both hands while walking in halls between the classes because they're less likely to actually do anything with their hands if they're occupied so to help stay on task i think that most teachers are pretty familiar with time timers now but the most important thing that we need to talk about is ensure that success is guaranteed and then gradually increase time as student improves or decrease time depending on what you're trying to work on and i think that time my my oldest and my youngest used time timers all the way through school and into their post-secondary uh, school so it became a really handy tool for them to use on a regular basis for themselves as well so teaching these skills to your students is is very important and providing auditory cues especially when they're having trouble uh, staying on task and, and there are apps on phones that will give an audible cue at regular or irregular. Irregular is almost better uh, to maintain focus. And as an, an example is an app called the Mindfulness Bell. And there's also interval training apps that can be used in a classroom for keeping people on task. And just tell them this tone is it. Just check in with yourself. Make sure you're on task and working on whatever it is you're working with. It's really important to organize, uh, to have organized notes. Uh, as an adult upgrade teacher uh, for Math 30-1, I have had many students who I cannot read any of their steps and I have to really decipher it. So what I usually do with those students, and these are adults that have gone through the school system, is I know I can't teach them to write in an orderly manner, but what I can teach them to do is put things around in a, up in a box and number them as to the order that their mind was working. And I've seen huge changes with students that suddenly I can understand their notes for one thing because I have a direction to follow and they their success goes up. And it doesn't take a lot of time to work with students with this. And it, it just encourages um, them to show work and it encourages them that it doesn't matter if it's their order and it works really well and assistive technology i won't speak a lot on because i know most people and most teachers and most schools use this extensively but it's just don't forget that this is really handy technology for people with Tourette syndrome with students with Tourette syndrome because of their difficulty writing because of ticks especially if they have hand and arm ticks so this kind of thing is really really important for use, especially with younger kids. Who do you educate? I recommend educating all teachers and not just the teachers of the students who have them because if they're going to come in contact with these kids, it's better that everybody has good understanding. And substitute teachers is a big one. If you have substitute teachers come in, it's a change. Their ticks are going to increase because they're going to be stressed. So make sure substitute teachers are aware of what's happening, at, especially what the plan is in place for the student. Teachers assistants, all students. I have had gone into schools where students were being bullied and I only went in and talked to the class that the kid was in and they started protecting the student and then the, the school would ask me to come and talk and educate everybody in the school, all the students, because the bullying went down. And I've had parents who have actually at, uh, thanked me for helping their students and for stopping the bullying. Uh, so education, I think, is paramount. Kids are good, but if they see something strange that they don't understand, they're going to react. So educating students, I think, is really, really important. Office staff, custodial staff, everybody you possibly can think of, bus drivers, parents, parent volunteers, because I know sometimes, especially with the swearing tick, parents will say, swearing's not allowed at school, why are you letting that kid swear? And hopefully the parents will say, it's okay to tell them that they have Tourette syndrome and we can do an in-service about Tourette syndrome so the parents can understand it. I want to talk very briefly about self-advocacy. This is a very important skill. However, people with Tourette syndrome, and I'm speaking particularly to my kids, they couldn't self-advocate uh, until, well, my oldest, until he was in university. So they may not be ready or able to self-advocate, especially when their symptoms are bad. It requires gentle nudging and it can take years. And don't forget help is available through to post-secondary years. My sons were, uh, my oldest son was helped in post-secondary to advocate to, for himself. They helped him 
connect with teachers, talk to teachers. And uh, now he's, he's great. It just takes them longer because think about all the things that are going on in their brain. It makes sense that it's going to take them long. So please don't get angry with your students for not self-advocating because it's really hard for them to do. They've got so much going on. So how uh, can the Tourette OCD network help? Well, first of all, we do in-class grade specific presentations. So please contact us anytime you would like to do that. You can do it in the context of anti-bullying. Anti we can do it in the context of uh, health classes. Uh, we can help out by coming to teacher professional development classes. And we will do with both in-class and teacher professional development, we would do uh, empathy exercises. So you get to live the experience of Tourette syndrome and obsessive compulsive disorder and ADHD. And uh, we also can provide support for strategies in specific situations. So if you have things are going along really well and then all of a sudden you, you can't th help the student, the student has, is stuck, you're stuck, please contact the Tourette OCD Alberta Network and we can help with brainstorming strategies. We might not be able to come up with the perfect one right away, but we can certainly get you going in a direction to, um, and suggest maybe some new things you haven't tried. So please contact us at any time, we're here to help. And thank you so much for listening to my talk. I hope uh, you learned something. I would love your feedback and uh, uh, thank you so much for your time.